record to the call. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and thanks for coming to our multi library author program with comic artists and writers Hannah Templer and Vincent Cow. Uh, this program is made possible through a collaboration with Wilmette, Skokie, Mount Prospect, Wheaton, Gail Borden, and Forest Park Public Libraries, which is awesome. Uh, during this program, if you'd like to ask either of the authors a uh, question, please use the Q&A feature um, on the webinar, and we'll address those um, at the end of the program, unless um, one of, uh, unless Hannah or Vince uh, see something they want to answer right away. Um, we're going to let Hannah and Vince introduce themselves and their work with a brief presentation. And then, um, oh, my name is Krista. I'm the Wilmette Public Library uh, teen librarian. We'll, we'll introduce our librarians real quick. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, I am Lisa Merrifield. I am the Wheaton Public Library teen librarian. And I'm Rachel Bild. I work at the Skokie Public Library. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll let Hannah and Vince introduce themselves and their work with a brief presentation. So let's get started with Vince. Yeah, so let me open that up again. Can you see it? All right. <laughs> okay, so yeah, hello. <laughs> um, my, my full name is Vincent Cow, um, but I brand myself as the cow for my work with the bull logo to match because like the bull, I am a male cow. <laughs> uh, I go by he, him pronouns, and my college brain thought that was clever, and I went with it. Yeah, he, he him. <laughs> here we go. And moving on, I am a Taiwanese-American artist based here in the northern suburbs of Chicago, more specifically Skokie. I've been drawing since I was a little kid, and being a very shy kid, I found my art to be a very powerful tool in helping me communicate with others. And when I got into anime and manga, I fell in love with the idea of creating my own comics and wanted to pursue it as a career as I got older. But I wasn't really sure how to do it at first and I was actually discouraged from doing it um, because at the time many people were saying like, oh, there's no money in comics. So if anything, I should focus on fine arts um, or illustration. So I sought education at Columbia College in Chicago and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Illustration. Um, and then I went on to be a self-proclaimed professional illustrator, making art for friends, friends of friends, coworkers, classmates, family members, you know, anybody and strangers online willing to pay for my art. Um, it wasn't bad. I loved the work I created. It was like my, my most proud work that I've done. And I was excited that people would pay for my artwork. Um, at, but I didn't give up on comics entirely. I thought, if I couldn't make it into a career, I should at least make it as a hobby. And so Mondo Mango, the, uh, the series right here, was born. Um, these were simple four panel comic strips that surrounded my everyday life, something I could make easily and share my wholesome experience of enjoying the little things in life. And before I knew it, it became my path to become a career, a comic career, which eventually led me to creating Magical Boy, <laughs> which started off as a web, web scroller. Um, if, for those who don't know what Magical Boy is, it's a LGBT plus action fantasy story about a teen trans man named Max, meaning he was assigned female at birth, but identifies as a boy. As soon as he comes out to his parents on his 16th birthday, he finds out he's part of a long lineage of magical girls, where it's his turn to pick up the mantle and save the world. So the, the story explores how he will find his way through this obstacle, become true to himself, and be the first magical boy. Um, as I mentioned, it first started as a webcomic scroller, um, but I, then I was very fortunate to have this webcomic be picked up by Scholastic, who then converted it into a print, a physical graphic novel, where volume one is out now, available wherever books are sold. So I'm pretty new to the traditional publishing world, but I'm ready to share that whole journey and process with you all. And so that so that's me. <laughs> awesome. Oh. <laughs> cool. OK, can you see my thing now? Yes. OK, so I'm Hannah Templer. Hello. Um, I'm a cartoonist living in Baltimore right now. Um, and I have been working as a cartoonist for the past five years now. I have a pretty similar story. I studied graphic design in college and worked at a graphic design agency. 
um, for a long time. But my dream was to be in comics and to do and to be a cartoonist. And um, but I was told there's no money in comics, so I decided to go a safer route and kind of uh, work that way. But um, one day, just got inspired to follow my dream, so I started taking freelance work and left my day job and started doing comics and that is what I do now. Um, so I do a lot of different things. I'm best known for Cosmonites, which is my ongoing webcomic series. Um, it's also a graphic novel. I think it's here. You can see that. Um, but it is the story of a teenage girl who um, runs away from home and it's set in this universe where there are uh, hold on, let me show that. It's set in a universe where there are these space gladiators that uh, fight for princesses' hands in these big tournaments. And this teenage girl runs away from home with a pair of space gladiators. But the twist is they're a married couple who are lesbians and they, instead of fighting for the princesses' hands in marriage, they free these princesses. So it's like a really exciting story about liberation and you know finding yourself and um, it's very queer and exciting. Um, I, as you can see, I really like working in color. That's like one of my favorite things is using like really bright colors and uh, really exciting world building. That's what I love a lot about comics and I'm sure we'll talk about this more. Um, but I really love just creating really vivid worlds and um, like adding a lot of detail into like the world building through comics, which is really exciting for me. Um, Cosmonites actually started um, as like a self-published really mini prologue, uh, which was like 28 pages. You can see it on the left here. Um, and this was self-published in 2016. And it was on, uh, it was just online. It was a web comic. And from there, it got picked up and turned into a full graphic novel, which is what you see on the right. And I ended up actually redrawing so you can see some of the same pages. Um, and how they kind of changed over three years and what the final version looked like. Um, and I just really quickly wanted to show this. I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but for Cosmonites, I do everything myself. Um, it is planned for print in advance. Um, and again, we'll talk about this, but I script everything myself and do all the thumbnails and then the inks and the colors and everything. So my process is kind of start to finish uh, all on my own, which is very fun. And yeah, these are these are pages from the second book. Uh, it's an ongoing series. So I'm currently posting the second book online and it updates every Friday and it's free to read. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk more about web comics and comics. Great, so yeah, now we're gonna go into our questions um, and if any of uh, um, you on the webinar have any questions again please feel free to put them in the Q&A um, and we'll try to get those out as well. Um, so our first question was um, how did you get started self-publishing comics online and then how did you build your site and developing develop a following with that? You want to answer first? Thank you. Sure <laughs> um, so how I started self-publishing like um, like I mentioned I started the Mondo Mango series as like something for fun to do as a hobby. So I started posting that on DeviantArt. Um, and then some people were recommending, oh, have you tried Tumblr? So I started posting on Tumblr where the Ask Me feature actually helped me, you know, connect with readers because they were able to ask me like questions directly. And then that's when I was told about Tapas and Webtoon, these comic focused platforms where yeah, these are places where readers actually want to read comics. And that's when my Mondo Mango series blew up um, because they are in front of these readers. Um, whereas DeviantArt and Tumblr is kind of too broad. So like that, that was a huge game changer for me. And that's how I started to see that people were really interested in. So instead of posting only once in a blue moon. I'm like, hey, I should actually do this weekly. And then that's how it began. And then I'd never really made a, a specific website for it. I, like Webtoons and Tapas are basically the home for my web comics. So yeah, that's how I, yeah. <laughs> that's how I started. Yeah, I got started with Tapas too, actually. Cosmonites is originally on Tapas in 2016. Cool. Um, 
yeah and I like I said I was working a day job so I basically just decided one day I was like you know what I really want to be a cartoonist I'm just gonna do it in the evenings after work and I'm just gonna make it happen because it's never gonna happen unless I just start so um I just I basically drafted out the prologue and kind of had the general for how the story was going to go and just jumped right in and started posting uh Cosmo Knight's pages in 2016 and I got really lucky um the like a lot of people like were really excited about it right away and like the staff at tapas like featured it on the homepage. like this was like kind of early in early in the site's days but it like got like a bunch of subscribers and people were really excited about it and that's how I actually got the attention of an editor who saw it and was like hey do you want to like make a book out of this and I was like oh okay yeah I, I think I do so that was incredibly lucky um, yeah, that's pretty crazy. We started at Tapas around the same time because yeah. around 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's definitely a good starting point too. Like you were saying, for getting an audience who are interested in comics, like those sites can be a great starting point to build an audience and like with consistency, kind of show what you're able to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna ask the next question, but I was like, wait, let me make sure that there's a link to Tapas. Um, oh. So y'all can check that out if you want to. Um, so next question, uh, can you please describe your drawing routine and like how often do you draw and like how do you break up your day? Um, I could, yeah, I could start. Uh, I actually uh, started the comic when I was part-time and actually, um, haven't quit my job. <laughs> I actually went from part-time to full-time. So when I was part-time, I did have like every other day, I would have a full day of drawing comics. Um, and I would draw them in parts, especially for Magical Boy, where it's a long form comic. I would make sure like, oh, this first week, I would make sure I would finish all the thumbnails for one chapter. And then the following week, I'll do the line art. And then the next, I'll do the coloring. And for Mondo Mango, since it's short, I could usually do that within four hours from start to finish. And I would just make sure I would have at least an hour a day um, to work on it. And I don't usually have a, have a set time because it was always changing depending on what the day was. <laughs> Especially when I moved full time now, I'm like, it's only how only have one or two hours <laughs> after work to actually do this art. So it has been a journey um, for the past year to figure mm -hmm. that out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's basically my routine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's tough to like manage your time because I, Cosmonites is my main project, but it's not where my income comes from. Like my income is from freelance illustration and licensed comics. So like, um, you know, I make money doing like, for example, I worked on Glow and like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff. So I have to kind of di divide up my time um working on those things to make sure I have a stable income and then working on my graphic novels around that um I'm usually I draw every day and I'm usually I draw a lot um in an ideal world I would draw less <laughs> I think but <laughs> um I probably draw like eight to ten hours every day uh, just like at my desk and I do try to you know take breaks and like walk around and stuff um and you know play with my dog I go outside and <laughs> try to have like a healthy schedule um but yeah, with just like between freelance illustration and working on the comic ends up being a lot of drawing. So I'm really glad that I enjoy it. <laughs> that is insane. Like, I'm always wondering, like, since you draw for that long, mm -hmm. do you ever run into art block a lot? You know, because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's constant <laughs> where I have like, oh, I have my day job. So it's like a break from drawing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's intense. <laughs> yeah, it can be difficult. I find that because I'm working on a lot of different things, if I am really like efficient at managing my deadlines and making sure, like the problem with art block always hits when I'm like rushed for a deadline. But as long as I like, am like working ahead and I've like managed my schedule properly, I can decide what I work on. So if one day I'm like, oh man, I don't feel like drawing, I can like work on coloring that day or I can work on like thumbnails for another project and I'm not like always scrambling to get everything done every day, yeah. Wow. It's great that you brought up art block because that was actually one of the questions that came up in the Q and A, which I promise we'll get to by the end. But someone asked what you do to get over um, 
writer or artist, mm -hmm. artist block. I didn't ever hear of art block before. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my question is, do, do you write up a script and plan out the layout of pages in advance or do you focus more on individual plan panels and then try to see how they go together? I usually bring up my Mono Mingo series a lot because there's a difference between like my short comic and in my long form Magical Boy. So for my Mondo Mango, since it's only four panels, I skip the scripting part. I just literally thumbnail out the four panels to see if it works. Um, sometimes it goes for eight panels long. Um, but especially for Magical Boy, I did have to script it out. It out. It was actually the first time that I ever script a comic mm -hmm. out entirely. And that was uh, something I had to learn and not psych myself out because I'm very insecure about my writing. Mm -hmm. But I realized it could be very simple. I could just start with panel one, description, dialogue, and that's it, you know? Um, and then I realized it's very helpful to start with the script, especially if you have an editor to look over it because it's hard for them to look at your scribbles and try to decipher it from that. And so like they need text to actually read it and help you spot grammars and everything. Because again, I'm not a writer at first, I'm artist first. Um, so that has really helped out. And you'll it's easier to catch things ahead of time because again, sketching everything out takes a lot of time. And when you just write a script first, you can catch things faster and you don't waste time sketching things that are not gonna be in the panel anymore. Um, yeah. 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 It's, I think it really depends on what kind of work you're creating. Cause yeah, for something long form for myself, like I really need a script, but then it, for like short form comics, I just jump right into it. I'm like, this is fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, for, I mean, I showed it briefly at the beginning, but for like, for my book, we, what I usually do actually is write everything more like prose. Um, this, this is just for me. Everybody has a really different process. And I should say that because like, I have friends who think very visually and they can only draw their scripts. They can't like write them out. But for me, I usually write everything like prose. Like I'll write out the entire story and everything that happens. And then I'll break it up into like, comic pages and I'll think about it in terms of a comic but I really need to have the story in my head first um, and I usually print my scripts out and then draw directly on the page um, and I'll draw like little pictures of what's happening next to my words just it just helps me like connect everything and then kind of build and assemble um, build and assemble like comic pages that way I will say even though I do all that I always end up changing a bunch of stuff like I'm going anyway like the dialogue and like some of the art like just changes the last minute I always say that the dialogue is like not set until I'm exporting the page because I will like change you know as you're working to if you've like drawn your character and they're acting a certain way and you're like they wouldn't say this like they'd say they'd say it this way or whatever or you just like change their attitude or their tone of voice and stuff um so there, it's great when you're working alone too because you have that flexibility when you're working with a big team obviously you can't do that but um, like for self-contained projects, yeah. So. I think Hannah actually uh, brought up a little bit of where the next question is going um, and how her pro their process works. Um, and do you do everything digitally um, or do you do a mix of digital and print to create your web comics? For me, I do everything digitally. <laughs> like after, like during college, that's when I made the switch from traditional digital and been sticking to that ever since because art materials are very expensive. And once you spend a lot of money just on the, <laughs> the technology stuff, it's like, yeah, I'm set. I could mm -hmm. keep doing art for a long time mm -hmm. <laughs> until that breaks, you know? Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've always did digitally, but I would try to still format it for the idea of like, I'm going to print this. I should make sure the resolution is 300 DPI at least mm -hmm. <laughs> so I could print it. Cause like, that's something I learned when I was trying to make zines when I was first trying to like self-publish. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's a really good point. Everything, and I, I would recommend this to a lot of people. Everything that I do, I make it big enough to be able to pr be printed because you never know like if someone is going to be like hey I want to turn this into a graphic novel that happens <laughs> or you don't want to be stuck in a situation where you're like oh man I have to redraw this entire book because I drew it too small or I didn't draw it so it could be printed um but yeah I also only work digitally um it is 
for me a lot faster also real life doesn't have an undo button which is like i have so much respect for people who ink traditionally because like i just i cannot imagine like i see pictures that people post online sometimes of like oh no like my cat knocked over my ink bottle and like this page is ruined and i'm just like i would cry <laughs> like i can't handle that i need an undo button like i would not like be able to start from scratch um but yeah i do work digitally i would like to work uh, traditionally and like experiment more. And I think uh, with that, it kind of depends on the project and like having room in the deadline and in the budget to take the time to do that. But that can be difficult, obviously, to uh, make sure that that's all in place so that you have the room to explore. Our only uh, fear is, you know, it crashing. <laughs> and so yeah. to make sure you save every <laughs> yes. other 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make sure you save. I have everything backed up in like three different places too, because I'm like, it's just not worth, it's not worth it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how did you go about going from your, you know, web platform to breaking into like traditional print comics? So traditional book publishing I would think like is um, being published by a publishing company right uh, I didn't get that opportunity until recently which is what I mentioned before is like I made Magical Boy for Tapas who then actually helped me pitch my web series to publishing companies so they made decks and cards and be like showing it to different publishing companies like hey are you interested in turning this into a print book <laughs> and so like uh, I have no idea how I would go about it if I was on my own. Um, I know some people have agents to help them pitch their stories to publishers. Um, but yeah, so that that's all still new to me. And I'm so grateful that like Tapas helped me do that and make, made it happen. Otherwise, I've only have um, experience self-publishing books where I try to figure that all the whole process myself um, where I made Mondo Mango into a book, physical book, by having it crowdfunded, you know, trying to figure out the printer, um, seeing who, how much they can make it, the different types of paper to use for it, mm -hmm. how much that would cost, and shipping and everything, since you're the one that has to distribute it, which is why traditional book publishing is so exciting, because they do all that for you, and then you can see it in shops everywhere. Uh, sorry, that's kind of like everywhere, but that's <laughs> my experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's like pretty similar to mine. I um, did all self-publishing. I mean, I was, even when I was working as a graphic designer, I would go to zine fairs and I used to make like little paper zines. Um, I didn't have as much time back then, obviously. So I do like a lot of like mini comics and like short little things and like gag comics, uh, but it was all self-published and I'll manage myself. And I think the beauty of web comics is that you, kind of don't there's not a barrier to entry like if you want to make something you just make it like just do it like go and do it and put it out and like it's all on you and no one is saying like you can't do that or like you, you don't have to like kind of like pitch it to anybody you can just make the thing you want which I love because I think that um offers a lot of independence and creativity and that's kind of where I started is um I had this idea for Cosmo Nights and I was like I'm just going to make this happen whatever it takes and you know whatever it's going to look like and then I printed it myself and that was actually how I broke into traditional publishing because I had something to show like I proved like I can do this I can make something and I think that's really really important um when you're trying to break into the industry is to show that you can like come through and you can follow through and make something and you're excited about your idea and like it's not just an idea you've you're really excited to actually like follow through and make yeah i'm things. so glad you mentioned that because yeah. i really feel that i got the opportunity to make magical boy because it that was something that tapas was like oh we're looking for artists to make their own original stories so they're like trying to it was like call a call to action you know open call for submission and I believe because I've been posting Mondo Mango comics on their website they saw that I was capable of making a series I have like I have a following that people are actually reading and so like I think that really helped them say like hey that person actually knows what they're doing mm -hmm. <laughs> and got me up there in the ranks of getting the opportunity so yeah, yeah so, like that's why these web comic places are great <laughs> mm -hmm. put your foot in the door without having resistance of like 
applying without anything you know Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah and it's I mean it's just great practice too like Mm -hmm. honestly like just building an audience and putting in time like all that stuff adds up it's not a waste of time like you get better at drawing you get better at storytelling like all those things do add up so I did have a question to you Hannah about like (laughs) digital publishing um so like you uh, the editor found you uh did you Mm -hmm. also did they uh, make that your agent I I saw that you had an agent like (laughs) to represent you is that someone you also had to find or they also found you yeah, I did it in a weird order. Like traditionally what you do is you you work on a pitch uh, with an agent who represents you and they take it out to publishers. But it was a little backward. I got very, very lucky. Obviously the editor found the book and was like, I, we want to publish this. So then I went and queried with editors or with agents, excuse me. And I was like, hey, I already have a publisher who wants to publish this. Do you, would you represent me? And like, look at the contract because you it it can be helpful to have an agent just to make sure like the contract's all good and um not you know like not taking advantage of you you're not going to lose rights and stuff like that um so I did it a little backwards but now that now I have an agent and he represents me um with like my other graphic novels now I I work with other writers and um like with new projects I can kind of work with him to pitch to uh publishers so that's really cool. Yeah. And you had to go through this whole research of like which agents you yeah, want to work with. Yeah, it, it's a lot easier to query with an agent if you already have an offer because they are very you already have money basically right. so they're already like interested. So it can it can look at it a little different. The traditional process usually is you query kind of with a pitch and you um you're pitching basically to say like this I you know I believe in this idea and an agent will team up with you if they also believe in your idea. So that's funny because I think I'm going towards your route where I'm also like I need to find an agent now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. I didn't start with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, I mean I know a lot of people that went that route too. It's definitely it makes I mean, it makes sense too. Mm-hmm. So which is crazy. Like this is the art world. There's no like one path <laughs> to yeah. the direction. Mm-hmm. It's just like all over the place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, so in adapting your your web comics to the print format, what was um, what was that process like? How did you make sure the pages worked the way you wanted them to? Especially, um, Vincent, I know yours was like a web scroller, which didn't even have pagination at all. And then I'm going to fold in this question from Britta in the audience who asked if you're happy with how your comics turned out and if there's anything um, you, you would want to change about the digital to physical. Right. So when I was making comics digitally for myself, um, this is excluding Mondo Manga, which is a strip, I, I, w- I was a big fan of anime and manga comic books. And so I would always try to format my pages to look like that. But when I was hired to, to create Magical Boy, Tapas was like, hey, can you create it so it's a web scroller? And that's something that I'd never tried before, like a very long format vertically. Um, so I threw all I knew about <laughs> print um, pages format and then like try to focus on like creating a series that's for that like vertical format. I'm like, how am I going to set up my page canvas? I have to make sure it's like a certain width and make sure it's super long, but then the canvas on my program is limited and so I have to cut it up to make sure I could form it together. So it's like elongated and so like that was a whole thing. Um, and then because I was, it was new to me and I was focused on making sure it fits the scrolling format and the pacing is different, you know, to make sure you're like, it's a phone, that's your screen. And then you have to make sure the pacing is right. So I wasn't thinking about print anymore. But once it was picked up by Scholastic, they're like, okay, yeah, we're turning it into a book now. And I'm happy that they said like their team will help um, or fo- will do it for me. They will reformat for me. And I got worried because there are panels that are super long, like past the, a regular page, a comic book page. I'm like, oh no, how are they gonna do that without cropping it weird? You know, so that was my only concern, um, but they did an amazing job. They found a way to make it fit without having so much gutter space. They overlapped images to make it work and look beautiful. Um, so that's how they were able to like make it work. Um, and then, yeah, I, it's like something I would have haven't thought for myself because I wasn't 
you know, thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that too, because I was really curious, like the adaptation from that scroll format to print, but I imagine like if someone has expertise in that, like that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, there was time where like I was able to review it and see like how they organize it mm -hmm. in a better way. So I was able to organize some pages where like, hey, it's kind of cluttered in this single page. Let's like space it out in a little bit. Um, maybe enlarge just one panel so it, you know, evenly space out the composition of the page. Um, so yeah, that 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 was <laughs> a struggle, but also mm -hmm. like very cool to work together on figuring mm -hmm. it out. So now moving forward, I can now merge the two where I'm like making sure when I'm making a scroller that it could also easily fit into a page. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm like very intimidated by that format. So I have <laughs> a lot of respect for that. I, I can't wrap my brain around it. Um, yeah, I when I do Cosmonites, I it's all for print. Like I would actually describe Cosmonites as more of a graphic novel that I put online for free than a web comic, just because like, it really is like the page is exactly what I'm printing. And I think about like what pages are gonna be facing each other and like, what is the page turn and stuff. So even on the website, like the odd number pages, the, le the even number pages, like that's left and right. Like it's very like exactly what you're gonna see in the book. Um, and that can be, I mean, that's really helpful for me just with like pacing and storytelling. And then with webcomic updates, I, I do like web uh, updates every week in chunks. But what I really try to do is make sure like every week something happens that drives a story forward. So it's, I don't necessarily do like a number of pages every week. I think about like pacing and story as well. Like I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what what is happening this week that's going to make someone want to come back next week? And does that mean I need to put up five pages this week instead of two, like, and sort of balance the story out that way? So. Got to keep them on with the hook. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Great. And then um, kind of how did you develop your drawing styles and how has that evolved for you over time as your careers and everything have transitioned. So my style, if you could see from Magical Boy, is definitely inspired, heavily inspired by anime and manga again. Uh, I was really into that and I wanted to be a mangaka specifically, you know, <laughs> a manga artist. Um, and so I still love the style and I think my style, like people can recognize it even though it's anime, like I have a specific anime style. Um, that's pertaining to me, but I think it's just from my habit of drawing certain ways and that becomes my style. For Mondo Mango, the style is actually chibi forms of my, of myself. Like that's the style that what it is. It's just basically large head, tiny body. And then I switched the anime eyes with bug eyes. So it was a lot easier to draw. And so I could draw it faster without, you know, because anime eyes are so detailed. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll just switch it up with bug eyes. So people are surprised and I'm like yeah it's based on anime <laughs> they're like what <laughs> it's just the eyes I tricked you um <laughs> yeah so that's basically my style mm -hmm. um yeah and for me I actually started as well I loved like anime when I was 11 that's when I started drawing and I was really into Digimon that's how I started drawing oh, yes. I would just trace Digimon for hours um and then uh as I got older, I got really, like, when I was in high school, I was really into drawing, like, dragons and monsters and stuff. Like, I would just sit in class with, like, a sketchbook and then my notebook for class and just, like, be drawing really scary things in my book. And my teachers would be like, are you okay? <laughs> I'm fine. I just like drawing scary things. Um, and then when I was in college, I kind of stopped drawing for a little while. Like I said, I was doing graphic design, so I just wasn't drawing. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, it was kind of, I would say it was kind of like an art block um, and we'll talk about that more, I'm sure. But um, it was sort of a reset for me because I had like a very specific way that I thought about drawing. And after <clears throat> doing something else for a few years, graphic design, like I was able to kind of like expand, you know, how I thought about layout and how I thought about uh, that skill. And when I approached it, it was, or when I came back to drawing, it was interesting because like that skill was still there. Like I didn't lose that, but I had a new way of thinking about drawing and um, my style was very, very different all of a sudden. Um, and I'm super, I'm like super influenced by like um, some like modern illustrators. Um, I really love like Sam Bosma and like Rebecca Mock. Like there's a lot of 
popular illustrators that really inspire me and um, that I kind of like draw a lot of inspiration from now as an adult, so. Do you think your graphic design background helped you with your color themes and color design? Because I'm so impressed by your color themes that you have in your comics. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think so. I think it really helped. And it's also, I mean, just it's a super useful skill for even like I, I built my website and stuff. But I think it for like it did impact the way I do storytelling. And I worked as like a user experience designer for a long time. So it was all like about organizing stuff. And now I am very into like piecing together stories like a big puzzle and I feel like it's all <laughs> connected like it's all the same skill now so yeah okay I'm gonna follow up on something that y'all have mentioned a couple of times and mm -hmm. two people have asked this in the Q&A um which is how do you avoid artistic burnout as a comic artist? And also, how do you get over writer's slash artist block? <laughs> That's difficult. Hannah, do you have, want to start? <laughs> yeah, I can start. Okay. Um, so burnout and artist block, um, very real. <laughs> and I feel like I, I, had, I was like really experiencing that last year. Um, honestly, like the first thing that I tell myself is like sleep, just sleep. Like you need sleep. <laughs> you need to just shut your brain off and stop because um, I think when I'm running at a problem, especially late at night, I will get very anxious and kind of try and do the same thing over and over. And what always ends up happening is I have to wake up the next day and redo it anyway. Um, so like sleeping is your friend, taking a break is your friend. And I, I say that all with the caveat that like, when you're working as an artist there are always deadlines and sometimes you don't have that luxury and that can be really really stressful when you when you have artist block and also something is due um again i even if it's a short break like walking away <laughs> just letting things sit can really really help because uh your brain can be your own worst enemy um and then just like more of a long-term thing with burnout i really try to do like have other hobbies outside of art like it's hard to create new art when your only input is creating art like it's good to go out and explore the world and like have hobbies and do other things like maybe playing a musical instrument or like taking a pottery class if that's like available to you or like just things that will like create more input for your mind watching movies reading books like anything that will fill up your like inspiration meter because when you're drawing when you're always creating like that can really drain like drain your excitement and you don't want to get to a point where you're just not excited about what you're doing anymore which I think I've definitely been in that place before you're like I am not having fun with this <laughs> I'm not doing my best work it sucks so yeah I agree with that all 100 <laughs> percent well <Yeah>. said um <laughs> I think what also helps like if you're not if it's not burnout and you're just struggling to start, I think a good tip is to like, make sure you're not distracted. You really have to put away your phone and make sure the browser's all closed mm -hmm. to really get, cause that, that's the hardest part to start because only it's only when you start having like, writing down that script, writing that first word where things start flowing, you know, and make sure it's past 20 minutes because I feel like when you get disrupted in between, you're, you know, you're stopping yourself and you have to start over and trying to start again. And so make sure you have like a set time to really focus. Um, because like I get really distracted really easily and it's hard to think of ideas when I'm just thinking of something else and wanting to do something else, procrastinating, you know? So you have to stop yourself from trying and really sit down to give it a go. Mm -hmm. And for writing, I think, write uh, a tip for writing because I always struggled with writing, um, was actually this post-it note technique where you write an idea for a panel down on a post-it note and then you post it on the board, like storyboarding, you know, but with written post-it notes and then you kind of, you could switch around. So it helps visually that you could see your script outline and then easily, you know, switch it around so you know like, oh, this might not work. Let me add a different thing. And it could be a doodle too. So I think that might help it to for your writing yeah i love what you said too about if you're having trouble starting like be focused but also just start like that's a really big one i think when you're feeling blocked for a project and you're very intimidated especially at the start of a project um 
like making sure you have like a space that's like calm and like not distracting and also just starting I think it can be really difficult but not worrying about like whether or not it needs to be perfect just something is better done than perfect like it's more exciting to like actually have something in hand than to procrastinate forever as hard as that could be to like tell yourself <laughs> so Oh, another thing, like, I think this is something that not many artists think about, because especially if it's for something you can't really tell others because it's um, NDAs or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, like, it's really important to, like, also talk to your editor if you have one or you have a best friend to, like, share your ideas to bounce ideas off, because if you're stuck with writing and you don't know what to do, and you're just in a loop. It's sometimes mm -hmm. nice to just, like, talk to someone about it. Um, I realized... I was having that struggle with uh, Magical Boy with this really intense scene where there's a huge conflict between the kid and the parent and just like turning to my partner and just telling him, like just explaining the scene, saying it out loud to them made me realize the dialogue that I just said, like that doesn't make sense after <laughs> I said it out loud. So even just talking to someone out loud like helps you realize certain things about your story because you're trying to explain it to them and then you realize your explanation was weird. I'm like, yeah. hold up. <laughs> and then they could be like, hey, what if that, what if this, if you did this? And like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? Because like, sometimes you just need outside perspective. Mm -hmm. I was going to say too, it's funny. Sometimes I'll be in the middle of writing an email to my editor with a question and I'll like answer it myself by writing it out. <laughs> I'll just be like, oh wait, I know. Yeah. It just takes kind of like getting out of your own head a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I this is a question that I've been wondering for a while. Um, so both of you offer your comics online as we've been talking. Um, and sometimes uh, before and sometimes after your print copies are available. Um, so what are the benefits and drawbacks to making them available for free online um, before the print run? And do you, what do you have to consider with keeping them online um, when it comes to the print copies? And do the publishers have any say in that? Right. Um, when I made uh, Magical Boy for Tapas, uh, the deal was actually uh, not only to have it exclusively on their platform, they were also going to put it behind a paywall. So like for their in-app currency, it's called Ink. Um, it's like 300 Ink or something. That's like like coins, you know, to, to unlock it. Um, so when I was actually in the middle of making it, I really wanted, I was afraid how people will react to especially my content of Magical Boy, where I'm taking a trans guy, making forcing him to wear a skirt and everything. I was afraid that it was gonna take be taken negatively. So when I was making it, I wanted it to be free. I asked Tap is like, hey, can you make this free as I'm working on it so people can see I have good intention for my main character. This is his journey. I don't have, yeah, I don't want people to be like, you're transphobic, what are you doing? I'm like, no, please give my story a chance. So I'm like, please, can you keep it free for a while until I finished? the series, at least the first season, you know? Um, and then they allowed that. And then once um, I was finished with that um, chapter, they that's when they started locking it again. And that's when they pitched it to Scholastic and now they're publishing it in book form. And so now it's like forever behind a paywall. But the first four chapters are still for free. So just people get a sneak peek of it. Um, and it was really helpful to have it for free just so people can see that aspect of it first because that was something that I was really nervous about, especially for my story. Uh, what, was, what was the other question, part of the question? Um, no, that's pretty good. That's, that's yeah. pretty much yeah. the answer. Yeah. yeah, you did great. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, that's really, actually, that's really interesting. I think that's like, uh, smart like <laughs> like to have forethought about that and like kind of like make sure you're um, pitching your comic correctly to like your audience and stuff um I yeah it, it Cosmonites um I I really wanted it to be free because that has always been really important to me um I was closeted for a long time and came out pretty late in life so um before I was out like queer content was really hard for me to access. Even, even from a library, like I could, you know, go read at the library, but to borrow a book would have been really challenging for me just with my life situation because I would have gotten questions and probably harassed and like 
So to have this online and free to read and like really easy to kind of like read like uh, at, like at your own pace and sort of like um, just be really accessible. That was like super, super important to me. So when it got picked up by a publisher, that was something I was really insistent on was like, it needs to stay online and it needs to stay for free. Um, it does, it can impact the contract like with Tapas obviously like you are being uh, like contracted to create a web comic. So like that works great. <laughs> a lot of like traditional publishers are really wary, although the, it's getting better. They're very wary of web comics. So they're like, well, if we give it away for free, no one's gonna buy it which is not true at all. People like owning things, they like gifting books. And like, especially with um, books like comics, they're really nice to look at and to have in hand. Like it's totally different. Like I love web comics, but every web comic I love, I buy as a book, like without fail. I love owning the books. Um, so usually it affects the contract a little bit. It depends on the publisher. The thing I see most often is that they will give you less money up front, but give you a higher percentage of royalties, which means as they sell copies, you get more money per copy. And it's kind of a way for them to mitigate risk and say like, okay, you can have it online for free, but you know, you get paid once it sells basically. Um, and I do think that's changing as well as like publishers get more confident with web comics. It's becoming a much more common thing for web comics to get published in print. I mean, Laura Olympus is a great example of like a bestseller in print as well as online. So um, I do think that's changing, but. I'm also thinking of Heartstopper too, like yeah, that was free exactly. online, and now everyone's <laughs> really excited for the Netflix series yeah. too. And then like, yeah, they're still buying the book, and it's still free online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I thought that was really cool, just to hear your perspective that you fought for it to be still free, completely mm -hmm. online. Because I was mm -hmm. like wondering, like, yeah, well, didn't they want? Because like that was mm -hmm. the number one fear of like, oh, but it's online for free, they're not going to buy the books. Then <laughs> what's mm -hmm. the bonus? I'm like, the bonus is they have a physical form mm -hmm. of the book mm -hmm. and it'll be available in libraries where people might have not have access to the internet you know that's why it's great to have these books also available in libraries and that's what I was excited for Magic Boy I'm like yes because people have told me like they have like especially uh teachers that saw mm -hmm. my book they're like I want to share this with my students and some of them don't have internet access to read online I'm like mm -hmm. oh my gosh yes soon I swear and then, uh -huh. yay it's out now I'm like yeah it's in libraries you could do your book clubs too with it yeah well and what you were saying too about like having it available for free so people can understand what it is and be interested in it like that's another great thing like I don't think I don't know the number of people that read all of Cosmonites online I'm sure there's a large group of people that read like 25 pages and they're like yes I'm sold I'm gonna buy it and then they buy the book rather than like read the entire thing online so it also helps with just like letting people see what the story is before investing i think that can be really important too so yeah yeah for sure yeah and it's really nice to get that instant feedback when you're doing posting online it's very fun mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's really rare when people message you after they bought the book and you're like not guaranteed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and our next question actually ties into one of our questions from our attendees. Um, what advice would you give to an inspiring comic artist? Um, any tips for students um, or what should they be focusing on while in college? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't know even where to start. I mean, I the thing I usually tell artists for sure is to allow yourself to fail and not have it define you um, meaning like you fail to draw a face a hundred times that doesn't mean you're a bad artist it's like the fact that you are trying you're working towards to improve and no one starts off being great at drawing it's like just keep at it be persistent um, and then you'll get there and then when going to college another thing is to like I did not know there were so many different careers for art because growing up, I'm like, it's just art, illustration, fine arts, your paint, and then you sell it in a gallery. When I went to college, I'm like, oh, there's storyboarding, visual development, product design, graphic design. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, what do I want to do? Um, I found myself spreading myself thin, trying to make portfolios for all these different categories, thinking like, okay, I can make money in storyboarding because that's kind of like comics. Oh, wait, maybe it's just, just illustration, maybe picture books, children books. Oh, no. And so like, 
yeah, I was spreading myself thin, trying to make all these portfolios. Um, so my advice like for that specifically is just to choose one path and see where that goes. Like give yourself a, a limit a semester to try th those things out to see if you like it and then just pursue it and see where it goes. Um, so that that's my advice. <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. Um, neither, I mean, neither of us studied comics in college, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. So that's part of the advice is like, don't worry about it. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, the the thing I would say is, um, well, two parts. So I would say, it, like, read a lot of, if you're interested in being a cartoonist or comics, like read a lot of comics and like expose yourself to a lot of different kinds of comics if you can. Um, there is so much out there and more now than ever, like so many good books, so many good like uh, artists, like really pushing the medium and doing exciting things. And I think to see what is possible can really help um, inspire you to find like your own place in like in the world or in the world of comics. Um, and the other thing I'd say is, um, oh my gosh, it just slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I have to remember this. Um, oh, I was going to say, don't underestimate the value of like enjoying something. Because I think when I was in high school and college, like all my, I loved my art teachers and I'm very grateful to them. But the feedback I got a lot from teachers was like, okay, it's really nice that you like drawing dragons or like anime or manga, but like, when are you going to get serious? And when are you going to like study? And I think it's good. It's definitely good to understand art history. It's definitely good to expand like beyond what you're comfortable with. Like, I agree with that advice. I do think like understand what's out there so that you can understand what you love. But like, if you love something, like just go for it. Cause like what ended up happening to me is I was I studied graphic design and I did graphic design and then like at age 27 I was like I know nothing has changed since I was 11 like I still want to draw like women in space fighting like robots and stuff like I am a nerd like that's never going to change and then once I pursued that like I made some of the best work I've ever made and I was like super happy and excited so definitely don't underestimate like if you love something like find a way to pursue that and like whatever form because as you get older too that stuff becomes more rare like being excited about things does kind of become more of a rare occurrence I feel like <laughs> so yeah. really value that <laughs> yeah because that's what motivates you in the end is mm -hmm. your interest right your love for that that topic that theme yeah. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah. <laughs> okay we have a few more questions in the chat, and I think we end at eight o'clock, right? So um, let's let's get let's get to all three of them are very important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the last one, I think we can we can finish with uh, Hannah telling us where they got their shirt. Yes, but we'll go <laughs> before that to um, um, where do you, where do you get your ideas? I feel like this is a classic and could possibly like go for a while. Um, so like do your best to to try and um answer it uh so we can get to the other one too but how do you think of your ideas do you have a specific method of brainstorming or do they just come to you i think that follows up with what we were saying of like what your interests are <laughs> right for magical boy i came up with the idea because i really wanted representation for the trans community and because of my love for Sailor Moon, I'm like, I put those two together. I'm like, oh my God, transforming into a magical girl is a great representation of like the trans man's worst nightmare. And that could be a huge story of figuring that out, you know? So that's something that might be an example of like it came to me, but that was from the baseline of my drive to want representation. Um, for Mondo Mango, that's easier. It's based on my life. So like, anything that fun that happens or something silly happens, I'm like, that could be a comic. And then you just have to be open for that, you know, to let that in, to be aware of like things could be a comic if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say like always have, I always have like my phone, like I have an app where I write down notes because if you get an idea, write it down <laughs> or even in the middle of the night, just write it down because you'll forget it later. And I always go back to that and I'm like, what was it? What am I thinking in the middle of the night? Oh yeah, I had like a million great ideas um in the shower too that's like where I get all my best ideas <laughs> but um I was gonna say too like yeah a lot of it is a personal experience like Cosmo Nights really I mean it's about 
you know, like women in space. So it's not really about my life, but it also is, it is, it is like very inspired by my life and kind of fighting for yourself and what it means to like fight for yourself as a woman and as a lesbian and like all those things. So um, I think being open to like being personal in your work and finding out how to translate that into like a story um, is, can be really effective too, from like drawing from your own life, yeah. Next question. <laughs> well, we have one more that was in the chat. We did talk about this a little, but if you have anything to add, mm -hmm. um, what does pitching a story involve? Mm -hmm. um, and would you recommend finding an agent? They are specifically asking if you pitch after it's completed or uh, what goes on your deck, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then also where where's your shirt from? <laughs> I will post it in the chat so we can answer this. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so for me pitching the only uh i pitched my story idea to tapas when they were open call for submission um it was just like two sentences of like my overall idea of magical boy um i think what helped again was like having my um and it was through email and then i showed my examples i didn't have anything i didn't have like uh sketches of my idea at the time because I was doing a Kickstarter for my Mondomingo book, <laughs> you know, crowdfunding that at the time, so I didn't have time. But like I had examples of my work prior because that's what I was doing. Um, so I showed them like, this is what it, it will look like. I have a colored example of my manga style that I want to use. I, I showed like two to three examples of that. And then I reminded them like, I also post on your website. Here's my <laughs> web series that I post on your site. And so that was literally it was pretty short and simple. Um, and then I, I believe I saw their pitch deck for pub showing it to publishers where they um, showed what the story was about and they showed examples of screenshots of parts of the panels. Um, so that that's my minimal <laughs> experience mm -hmm. with pitching. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. I did not have much to say. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, that sounds good. I think it's like stand, the standard is to have like a few pages of the comic and like character designs and script, but every like if you especially if you're working with an agent, an agent will like want something different from you depending on who they are. Like some agents will want more pages, some of them will want just the script and no artwork. Like it really depends on um, who you're working with. I'd say like do whatever it takes to show that like show your story, like be able to like show what you're talking about and like get someone hooked and whatever that looks like for you um is what it's going to be so yeah so like i'm saying like uh it's so important to just get started so you have all these examples to sh to pitch to an mm -hmm. agent and then the agent could help you pitch to more people and help you guide through that and that's why i should look into an agent too <laughs> like yeah just getting started so you have examples of your work is the most important thing mm -hmm. Can we fit one more question or it's eight o'clock? Mm -hmm. Well, it's up to you. I, I had wanted um, to hear some of your favorite comics or comic artists and writers real quick, either print or online. Mm -hmm. um, and that sounds like a good question to end with as mm -hmm. well. I have a few webcomic artists that I always enjoy seeing and they're pretty popular. <laughs> one is like Sarah Scribbles. I love her work. Mm -hmm. um, Beanie is another one. Um, yeah, there's just so many webcomic artists that I'm out like would love to talk to more intimate. And like I for youth graphic novels, um, I don't know, wait, is Heartstopper <laughs> youth graphic novel? Like mm -hmm. I yeah, I'm a fan of Heartstopper, Alice's work. Um and uh who the the witch boy that was another one i really enjoyed yeah, was, <laughs> and, yeah yeah so those those are the few um yeah i had mentioned a couple um i really love sam bosma and he did fantasy sports which is a really fun series um that's in print that's not a web comic um i do also love um there's this comic called junk wraith by eleanor ritchie that i really really love i think it's on Tapas maybe, um, and Verse by Sam Beck is another webcomic that I really, really love and would recommend. Awesome, thank you. I've been writing all of those down. Um, 
we'll post it somewhere on the, you know, wherever this video is found, we'll send out those recommendations <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so it's just a little after eight. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, Vincent. It was amazing to have you here talking with us. Yeah, um, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, this is recorded, so you will be getting um, a link to the recording eventually. Uh, so share it widely. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Bye. Bye.